God is life, essentially. It is His nature and essence. It is Himself. It is in and of Himself. The Father has life in Himself, and so has the Son and Word of God, and likewise the Spirit, called, therefore, the Spirit of life. And what is true of all the persons in the Godhead, they partaking of the same undivided nature and essence and living the same life, is true of God, essentially considered. And as the life of God is of Himself, it is independent. There is no cause from whence it is or on which it depends. Now God must have life in the highest degree of it, as explained, even essentially, originally, infinitely, and perfectly. Or He could never give life in every sense unto His creatures. And He must live forever to continue eternal life, particularly to His people, and preserve them in it. How can we see life? Is life tied to obedience? Is a covenant a two-way street? When is the first resurrection? What will enable us to be faithful unto death? I want to know. We would like to welcome each and every one of you to this week's episode of The Doctrine of Christ, and we do so with great joy, because whether you know it or not, the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And it is a great joy to be back once again, Brother Jimmy, doing The Doctrine of Christ. Amen. Have you come down from the weekend yet? Well, yeah. Um, it was just um, the Pentecost celebration of the Puritan barn you know, we could tell you in words, you know, we baptized the the figure was 106 people we baptized and the crowd was just on fire for God. And it was just a pretty good Pentecostal celebration. Mm. And you just had to be there to feel the blessing of the spirit that the father sent. And it was just great. And your ministry was tremendous everyone was thrilled to meet you and it was just a great time we got to meet so many of yeah. our our listeners and it was just truly a blessed time and all of you that weren't able to come maybe the next event you can because it was just a heavenly blessed event yeah i couldn't believe people had driven from new mexico from boston massachusetts baton rouge louisiana all over the place Delaware, Maryland, Kansas, Michigan. Yeah, I mean, just just really touching with the price of gasoline and the sacrifice people made to came. It was just really, really touching. And it I, was just a wonderful, I, wonderful I, time. I tend to believe uh, God's going to bless them for their efforts. I know that he will. And I think everybody that was there was mightily blessed from the Lord. Wisconsin mightily. people, too. Oh yeah, Wisconsin people. That's Michigan a good bit. Of, that's a little drive too. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere's a good bit of drive. The way gas is. I know. Yeah. Well, it was great to meet everybody, and it was such a blessing. So, and oh, and that's the first time I've ever seen you preach in front of a group of people. I've never. I've, you're just always teaching here <laughs> on these videos, David. You were. You were. You were on fire. Yeah. There was such a presence of God there, you could have put a broom up, and the broom could have preached. Uh, it was just that. It was just an awesome anointing from the Father that was there. It really was. And it was just a blessing, just a honor to be able to be a part of it. And uh, But it was. It was just felt so good. Just felt so good. Such a blessing from the Father. Well, what do you got for us tonight? Well... We're going to talk about the attribute of life. And life is one that doesn't make the list of attributes of a lot. They don't think about life being an attribute. And as you shared with me, John Gill talked about life as an attribute. And in James Strong, the fellow that wrote the Concordance also has a three-volume systematic theology. And in it, 
he talks about life as an attribute from God. He says the scriptures represent God as the living God. And in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and everlasting king at his wrath. The earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. And he is distinguished in the scripture from all other gods because he is the living God. He is not only living, but he is the source of all life. All life begins with him, whether it is natural life or whether it is spiritual life. And all of the other so-called gods have no life in them. They only have death. In First Thessalonians 1 and 9, and this is the way that the true God is distinguished in the Old and the New Testaments from the false, he's alive. In First Thessalonians 1 and 9, for they themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And that's what we want to be our study and our meditation uh, for this evening, the attribute of life. And as we do, as we have found with all the attributes, and as we have found with the Ten Commandments, that uh, once we meditate on the depth of this understanding, it'll just be a tremendous blessing to us. And Jesus is God. We emphasize that all the time. And he is part of the triune Godhead. And when Jesus came to earth in the flesh, he had life within himself. He did that attribute of deity of life was in him when he was a man upon the earth. And it says in John chapter 5 and verse 26, for as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. And the attribute of life was in the man Christ Jesus. And as he ministered, people that came into contact with him and expressed their faith in him, they had transmitted to them the attribute of life that is a part of, it is the very attribute of God himself. And in the Gospel of John chapter 1, and verse 3 and 4, Jesus was the creator, and he is the source of all life. And when Jesus came to earth, manifested in the flesh, he became the only way that the life of God can be transmitted to anyone else. No other way. Jesus had life transmitted to him from the Father, that in his incarnation, this life of God would be carried with him. Paul said that he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The life of God was enclosed within that flesh. In John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There is no life outside of Christ. And when he became flesh, that life was in the man Christ Jesus. No one will get eternal life except they go back to Christ. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the Holy Spirit just call people home to Jesus, to him. He's the only source of life, the only source of truth. It's all about him. It's all about him. Yeah, that's that's a scripture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. No man comes yeah. through the Father except through me. Yeah. And until we understand that the Word was made flesh and uh, the attribute of the life of God was in that flesh and no other way to the life of God other than through Christ. No other way. And as... Uh, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we know that when God created Adam and Eve, they were created in perfect communion with God. And it says in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, 
And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that life was breathed into Adam and Eve from the very breath of God. And we know how the story goes in verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For on the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the lie of the devil, of course, in uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. And that's the message that is put forth by the American evangelical church, that sin doesn't kill. That, you know, the idea, uh, and we were talking about a song lyric and before the show, which is typical of so many, that sin won't separate you. And the idea that, well, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, but I haven't accepted him as Lord yet. Now, you hear these altar calls, well, maybe you're out there tonight and you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Well, you need to step up and accept him as your Lord. That's a half gospel, and a half gospel is no gospel. And it doesn't, it's going to take more than a song and a sermon and the swoosh of their theological pen to do away with the reality of sin being deadly. Sin is very, very deadly. And when Adam and Eve ate um, of the fruit of the tree that they were forbidden to, they died spiritually. And Genesis 5 and 5, it says, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died physically. But the minute that they disobeyed God, they become spiritually dead. And that spiritual death came because of sin. And sin is still deadly. And it seems like everything that comes from the modern evangelical church, it wants to send forth a message that sin is not deadly, that obedience is uh, optional. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Hmm. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, it says it in the Old Testament, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, and the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the very same thing, I don't know, well, I do know where it comes from, but it's horrible that people will try to put forth this idea that in the New Covenant, uh, sin is no longer deadly. Someone said, rightly so, one time, it says there's two kinds of preachers. And one is the preacher that says, when you're born again, the sinner's changed. And the other preacher says, when you're born again, sin has changed to where sin is no longer deadly to you. But sin kills in the New Testament also. The scripture that used to be uh, a memory verse that almost every believer, it was part of that old Romans road in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's such a sad day when the simple gospel and the plain truths that are put forth in scripture uh, that we somehow have to uh, it's like we're talking about things that have become foreign to the ears of modern American professors. Now, we know in the Word of God, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13, Adam and Eve were born and they had the life of God transmitted into them. When they sinned, they died. And even though their heart was beating and blood was gushing through their veins. They were spiritually dead, and they were without the life of God within them. And that spiritual deadness is transmitted unto all the race of Adam. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, 
And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. The law was, don't eat of the fruit of the tree. The devil said, you'll not surely die. This is the number one satanic doctrine that people can willfully disobey God and not suffer spiritual death. But there's an answer. There's an answer and there's a way provided. It's provided by Jesus Christ. And he is called in scripture, the second Adam. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last man and the last Adam made a quickening spirit. And through the cross and through the faith that the death of Christ upon the cross paid the penalty for our sin debt, people can have the life of God restored to them. And like we've already emphasized, there's no other way. There's no other way. And as it says of the doctrine of Christ in the epistle of Second John, he that hath not the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And when we place our faith in Christ, it means we believe he is who he says it is, who he says he was, and we believe what he says, and we actually follow him. I, I say, I make a deep theological statement. I say following Jesus means we follow Jesus. We actually follow him and obey him and uh, worship him. So it's a pretty simple proposition, but somehow this has got really muddied up to the idea of that you can have the life of God in you while not following Christ, while not obeying what he said, and while living in sin. And you might have a good, healthy heartbeat, good blood pressure, but you do not have the life of God within you. Is that how you came up with the name of your ministry? Yeah. Followers of Jesus Christ? Yeah. And this goes back to the early 80s when there was a night when Don and I and another couple, we were praying all night and literally the sun was coming up and the Lord severely rebuked me. And I went to the woodshed and I've told you before, next time you're there, look and you'll see my initials carved in the wall. And he told me a very, it seems like when the Lord speaks to you, it's very clear. It's very uh, succinct. But he said, from now on, you tell them what I said. And from that time, that's been my goal. Uh, My other agendas have been put aside, and I've dedicated myself from that day to this very night, and even now more than ever, to be committed to telling people what Jesus said and telling them over and over and over. It's the most important thing in your life, because if you don't have the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. You don't have life. You know, Jesus wants you to have life. He come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly, John 10 and 10. And that's what we want to do. We want to tell you how to have the life of God. And all you have to do is truly repent, place your faith in the cross for Jesus' death as the payment of your sin debt, and just humbly submit to him as your Lord and walk in obedience unto him. It's easy. I mean, well, and you know, it's there's there's stuff goes along with it. We know, but it's it's an awesome thing. Jesus said, "My yoke is easy, my burden is light." Jesus will never let you down. He will never let you fight a fight by yourself. He will be there with you. He will never disappoint you. He will bless you in ways that are beyond our comprehension. I just can't brag on our wonderful Jesus enough. He's just so great. Amen. In um, 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, there's a very clear statement that uh, we just really need to get. And this study on the attribute of life, it'll really help us to bring it into focus. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, which means, again, his coming in the flesh. He, He appeared 
in his incarnation, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is through the gospel. Jesus came as a man. He had life within himself. He has made known unto us life and immortality. You know, there's this uh, Marvel show, The Immortals, about the pagan gods and everything. Well, there's real immortality, but it only comes through Christ. Think of that. We're talking about, and of course, one of the aspects of life is not only that life, that spiritual life that thrills our hearts, but eternal life forever. We're talking about immortality, and life and immortality have been brought to life through the gospel. It's the good news that if you, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He died for your sins. And if you just repent of your sin, place your faith in him, he will give you a new nature. The very, we've talked about that scripture multitudes of times about we became partakers of the divine nature in Second Peter. And this attribute of life will be in you and the very life of God. You don't get it anywhere else. Nowhere else. That life was manifested in the incarnation, the Father manifested that life in Christ. It's in him. He has manifested it through the gospel. No other way. No other way. It's that way or no way. And it's it's so marvelous that we can preach the gospel and tell people this is the way to life and immortality. It's made available through the good news. And boy, is it good news. And it is just the, the best, best, and the very best. I want to read something from uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. This is volume two, and I want to read on page 854. And it says this, Understanding the faith and life of the righteous in the present being regarded as a precondition and even a foretaste of eternal life. And in other words, the eternal, the life of God we have in us now, it's a foretaste of the eternal life that we will one day have. Circles which accepted belief in the resurrection interpreted in this sense the corresponding promises in the law and the prophets. Now, let's read a couple of them. And this is very important. And this just gets right back to what we were saying earlier. And in the Old Testament, and this is the point that was being made, that life is connected to the promises in the law and the prophets. Let's listen to the Torah and what it said in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18 and verse 5, ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Life is tied to obedience. And we, we did the, the DLC on love, and we showed how that's so clear all over the Bible, there is no love that doesn't manifest itself in obedience. And there is no eternal life that will be received that does not come through the path of obedience. And you know, there's a reason why that 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 the enemy tries to to make us think Leviticus and numbers, they're so boring and drudgery to read through and all this stuff because there's so much uh, truth in there like you just read. Yeah. They don't and want us to know that the commandments are important now. Yeah. And they want us to believe that with a song and a sermon and a $20 book that's an eighth of an inch thick that the Ten Commandments have been done away with. But it's not the case. God's word will stand. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And 
you know, people just like this idea, well, I'll accept Jesus as my Savior, then maybe someday I'll accept him as Lord. Now, this is door number one and door number two. Door number one, you make a confession that Christ is your Savior, and you keep on sinning. Now, you can do that or you can quit sinning. Now, what's the carnal man going to do? Well, yeah, I can I can profess Christ and sin too. And that's what the carnal man wants to do. And it's a lie. It's a horrific lie. And we have an old covenant. When the father came down and he wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments in stone, we have a new covenant where the Holy Spirit writes the Ten Commandments upon our heart. No difference, except that one is written in stone, the other is written in our heart. There is a new covenant. Now, (laughs) people, you know, and of course, the new covenant is different. It's better. It's based upon the sacrifice of Christ, but it's a covenant. It's a covenant. That means, and, uh, you know, this is just like in the Wizard of Oz when they threw water on the witch. He goes, ah, but. A covenant means that we have responsibilities too. A covenant means you agree to do certain things. I agree to do certain things. And when someone doesn't live up to what they said to do, the covenant's broken, you say. We're in a new covenant. And Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He will put his spirit in you. He will give you the ability not only to will, but to do. Paul said in Philippians, he will put his spirit in you to make you want to do what's right, and he will give you his spirit to enable you to do what is right. It's 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 so great. It's so great, you know, and you just want to, uh, we, we struggle to find words to express the greatness of it and the good news. He has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel, and what a great thing it is, but it's a covenant. It's a covenant. And just like uh, the author said, all through the concept of life in the in the in the Torah, through the prophets, it's tied to the promises of covenant obedience. Always. Let's read a couple more. Let's read in Deuteronomy and let's read in verse 30 and beginning in about verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death. Now, it sounds like the father's kind of serious, isn't it? I'm calling heaven and earth to record that I'm set before you life and death. It's on you. You're going to choose. And everyone that understands the gospel as it's presented, if you refuse it, you're choosing death. You're choosing death. You're knowingly saying, I love my sin more than Christ. That's a choice. And you're going to have to live with it. And you're going to have to die with it. And that's the way it is. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, and that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mightest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. He is thy life. Choose life. Walk in obedience. Obey his voice. He is your life. There's no life in you. You have no life. Even if your heart is beating, you got a good BP, you have no spiritual life until you get it from God. He is the only one that has life, the creator of all life. That life is only through Christ. No other way. And the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell on the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So that's it. 
it's very plain. It's very straightforward. You might not like it, but it's hard to argue with the tremendous clarity of the Word of God. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And truly, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ, it comes down like a refreshing mist. In verse 44 of Deuteronomy 32, And Moses came and spake all the words of the song and the ears of the people, he and Hoshea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe, to do all the words of this law, for it is not a vain thing. Now, you know, these issues are controversial. We're going to talk about another one before we're done. And, you know, you can say, well, am I going to make a big deal out of this or am I not? Well, we got to make a big deal out of it because the Father does, makes a real big deal out of it. And for it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. It is your life. And through this thing, ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. Not only our physical life can be cut short, but our spiritual life for all eternity can be cut short. It's not a vain thing. This is a big deal. And we have to emphasize and we have to understand that life is from God, that life comes from covenant, and having the life of God within us depends upon our submission to covenant obedience, as much in the new as in the old. Now, we've talked before about this Rich Mullen songs, quoting Deuteronomy to the devil. I really like that song. And uh, one of the songs, the verses, is Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live live. Our life comes from Christ. Our life is sustained by the Word of God. That's what we live by. Every word, and we're not talking about reading the newspaper, we're talking about the words of God, the very doctrine of Christ. It's our life. That's one of our first DOCs ever. You know, Jesus quoted that at his first temptation from the devil, I think, was because he was hungry, right? So, yeah. It says, turn these stones into bread. And then that's exactly how Jesus combated the enemy right there with that scripture. Yeah. Well, and you know, I guess if Jesus quoted Deuteronomy to the devil, he must have liked it. He must have, you know, if if he would have thought Deuteronomy had expired, he'd have probably done something else, you know. But, yeah. you know, he likes it nighty till. And this is another concept. Um, there is so much talk the charismaniacs, the Copenhagens, they'll talk about being little gods. You know, I'm a little God. Well, inherent in the concept and the idea is that, well, I guess if you're God, you can do what you want, you know. And they literally say that they have, they just become little Christ, they say. And something that really needs to sink in is 1 Timothy 6.16, who only hath immortality. Immortality belongs to nobody but God. Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That life was manifested in Jesus Christ when he came to the earth, and it was released unto us when he died upon the cross. Nobody else has it. You think you can listen to a tape and say you're a little God? Well, you're not. 
You're not a little God. If you get uh, hit by a car, you're going to bleed. You're not a little God. And um, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, which no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And this is something that the teachers of unconditional eternal security, uh, they try to make a big deal out of this. And they'll, they'll say, well, eternal life is like a diamond. And if I give you this diamond, you've got eternal life and no one can ever take it from you. Well, that's a horrific, misleading, unscriptural representation. I, I thought you were going to say porky. Well, it is. It's a huge porky. <laughs> I mean, it's a deadly porky. That's a poison porky. And what the word God, God says in 1 John 5, 11, this would be a great memory verse. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The life is in the Son. He has given unto us, and when we believe in Christ, we have the life of God in us, but it's just because of the life in Christ. And the minute, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, without me, you can be not, do nothing. Uh, if any man not abide in the vine, you're cut off, you're gathered and burned. You see, it's a relationship. It's covenant. It's covenant of obedience and faith. That's where that life is manifested, and that life uh, isn't uh, uh, there any other way. Absolutely. The life is in his son. Only in the son is life. He has brought life, the life and the immortality of God to light through the gospel. It doesn't come any other way. And when we place our faith in Christ, we don't become little gods that are immortals like in a Marvel movie, but we have that eternal life because it is in Christ, manifested us through the gospel, and it is ours through a relationship. Choose life and live. This was the message, the clear message of the old covenant and the new. There is no, there is no other way to have life, and it is so abundantly clear through the Word of God. I want to read from another book here, and I have to give a little warning on it. Uh, this is the Greek lexicon of the New Testament and early and other early Christian literature by uh, Frederick William Danker. I'll hold it up here. And the reason why I give a warning on it, because if you buy it, there's no cheater numbers on it. And of course, it didn't. It's not beyond the ability to use, obviously, or I wouldn't be using it. But you have to have a little higher learning curve because it's alphabetized in Greek with no cheaters. So it's just a, just a warning. A lot, there's a lot of good helps that have the Strong's numbers that are real easy. This is a, a little more, but it's worth it because this not only gives you the way the word is used in Scripture, but the Septuagint and all the early church fathers, non-canonical writings, it can really tell you some stuff. And we'll give an example of that. And there's a real great usage here that we've talked about before, and uh, the author here brings it out from the very meaning of the Greek word itself. But he says here that life is a resurrection which corresponds to the Christian's possession of eternal life here and now, a resurrection proceeding from life. A resurrection here and now, proceeding from life. We've talked about the first resurrection, and this is one of the basic meanings from uh, uh, the lexicon of what life is. It means resurrection now. And let's look at some scriptures. Let's just do, let's just pump a little leather and let's see some of the very clear statements that Christ said about life. I like that we do this. Yeah. Look at all these scriptures. Yeah. Well, the scripture's going to be right. <laughs> you know, you can argue with me, but you better not argue with this. That's right. And it's it's so clear. And w when you just, it, everything is so doggone confusing 
because everybody just gets up and says all kinds of different things. And when you're ready to stop listening to all of the voices and just listen to the voice, the confusion goes away. And until you do that, the confusion will be with you. And you'll just be wondering, well, which earthly man should I follow? But there's only one man, that man that has life in himself. And we will receive life through following him. It is the most important thing in your life, I guarantee you. John 3.15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life life. We have eternal life now through faith in Christ. And also in verse 36 of John 3, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. If you reject faith in Jesus Christ, what he said and did, you have no life, you have the wrath of God upon you. Very clear, straightforward, didactic statements. John chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And that life. Can I show you this based on what you just said? Yeah, you sure can. Can you see that? Whether you know it or not. Oh, boy, Jimmy, do I like that. Man. Uh, some some people who watch this did this hand. That's a hand painting. Oh, my goodness. And it's a one of a kind. Oh, and, boy. And it's, got, and it's that water. That's oh, why when you said that. Boy. So the words of Jesus, Woo. that's that water of life right there. <laughs> oh, man. Isn't that cool? Oh, gosh. What are you talking about? Man, that's great. Oh, I love that. That love says it right it. there. Love it, love it. it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, boy. And this is this is what we emphasized over and over, that when you're born again, this is the first resurrection. Mm-hmm. And that's what uh, Mr. Danker was saying, that this is inherent within the basic meaning of the Greek word from its usage in Scripture. And let's just read what Jesus said. It's right here, and this is uh, John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Now, right there in the first part of John 5, 24, believing in what Jesus said is a prerequisite of eternal life. If you reject, if you don't believe what Christ said, You know, you've excluded yourself from eternal life. This is what Jesus said. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. We put the doctrine of Christ out every week, the best, very best that we can. And Jesus said, you must believe my my doctrine, and you have to believe the Father sent me. If you don't, there's no other way to that life that came with Christ. He goes on to say, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. As we explained earlier, everyone is born spiritually dead because of the sin of Adam. When we repent and believe in Christ, we pass from death unto life. That's where life comes from, from Christ. Now look at verse 25. When we believe in what Jesus said, and uh, believe the Father sent him. Look at verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. As the Son of God stood upon this earth and talked to these people, he said the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. You are passed from death unto life. You are resurrected spiritually when you place your faith in Christ. This is the foundational teaching of the doctrine of Christ. The Puritans got it. We brought them on one after another. We've talked about the importance of the first resurrection. It's inherent in the basic meaning of the Greek word. But this has just another one of the many things, and it's because of millennial reign teaching that this doctrine and the understanding of new birth being 
resurrection life now. The hour is coming, and now is, right now. You're going to pass from death unto life. You're going to experience a spiritual resurrection. And we're talking about the greatest gift you can ever have, the life of God, for goodness sake, in your heart, in your life. Nothing can thrill your soul than the life of God and it's right there for us, and it's all over our Bibles. It's all over our Bibles. Even that next verse, number yeah. 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus has life in himself. Yeah. You want it? You go there. You don't get it anywhere else. Nowhere else. So his life is our life. Yes. He is our life, and Paul expressed that in Colossians 3, and our life is hidden in Christ. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, in Colossians 3, and we're, we're going to be there in just a second. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, uh, Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we die with him by faith and let the old man die, that resurrection life comes into us. No other way. And in verse 11, likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the way that we think of ourselves as dead unto sin and resurrected with Christ, alive unto Christ, walking by faith with that life in us. And now, now listen, when I've heard people use that too, he says you're dead to sin. So that means. Uh, if I sin, that I'm dead to that, you know. It's, but if you just go right on to the next verse, yeah. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye yeah. should obey it and the lust thereof. Yeah, and it, it it it's so it's so sad to see the way people twist the word of God, and they're truly twisting it uh, to their own destruction. And Paul said in Romans eight seven. Uh, well, in verse 6, he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And here again, right in the New Testament, uh, to be spiritually minded is life and peace and subjection to, subjection to the law of God. Listen to that. How, I mean, let's just read that again. I mean, my goodness, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's amazing. Um it is just amazing and it's frightening because we get on here every week and we're speaking to people that think they're saved and right with God. And if they do not turn, they're they're headed for everlasting destruction. Well, what's a quick example of a carnal mind? Well, a carnal mind is, you know, and we, we've talked about the attribute of omniscience. And we talked about the text in Isaiah. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Now, the carnal mind, if they would write the gospel, the carnal mind would say, you can profess Jesus as your Savior and keep on sinning. You know, the carnal mind will please the flesh. Mm. You know, the carnal mind will say, you know, you're forgiven your sins, past, present, and future. Therefore, you don't even have to ask forgiveness when you mess up. The carnal mind will always gratify the flesh. And it will just put you to sleep. Uh, it's Is the a carnal big... mind the one that came up with the, uh, well, he knows my heart line? Yeah. 
Was yeah. that a carnal mind thought? <laughs> yeah. And basically the carnal mind, when you read the word of God, it will minister to the new man and the new nature within your heart. It will thrill your soul. It will build you up. But the modern message, it is not geared to blessing the spiritual man, but the carnal man. Mm. It is to feed the carnal man, to strengthen him, to even have him more set in his ways that he can be saved and have the life of God without obeying him. And all of their goosebumps and all of their thrills, it is not the life of God. Because the word of God is very specific. The life of God is only given through covenant obedience. And just like Paul said, that carnal mind can't be subject to the law of God. Evidently, sounds like Paul thought being subject to the law of God might be kind of important. And right there in that text, as in all of these texts, the life of God is just tied to humble covenant obedience. It's just it's just right there. It's You just can't get away from it. And in the text I referred to just a moment ago in uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, the text here says, Sister Donna's favorite verse. It says, uh, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. You're resurrected. If you're whiz, risen with Christ, resurrected with him, set your affection on things above. We're talking about a resurrection here. The hour is coming and now is. You're going to pass from death to life. You're going to have a resurrection. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. We are dead to sin through faith in the cross, and literally our life is hid with Christ. It's hid with Christ. We don't have eternal life as an unconditional possession like they tell us, but we have it because we're hid in Christ. It's relationship. Life is in the Son, and he's manifested that to us, but all we have to do is just respond in humble obedience. His yoke is easy and he's burden light, but it's a covenant. It's a covenant. And it's not just uh, do what thou wilt. Uh, the law of Satan is do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. And uh, the law of God is thy will be done, not your will be done. Now, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, it's the failure to understand anymore, as our Puritan friends did of old, the first resurrection that makes this verse so unintelligible uh, to so many people. But in Revelation chapter 20, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be a bad guy here. I know I went through this myself. I had this stuff brainwashed with it. But we just have to come to the place where we just have to say, if Jesus said it, he's God, I'm going with it, because if we believe his word, that's when we're passed from death unto life. It's not believing anybody else. We can't get life from a theology book. We can get some good stuff from some of them, or pretty good, mm -hmm. but our life comes from a relationship with Christ. And Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years, which reign is going on now. Um, I want to read a great comment on this text from Daniel Whedon's commentary, and it is just really good. And Brother Whedon said this, this is initiated at our earthly regeneration, but it is not completed until the glorification of our spirits. That is exactly what we're talking about. We are resurrected when we're born again, but it will be completed when our body is resurrected. He goes on to say, our souls pass through as true and literal a resurrection as our bodies. Amen. We have to understand that the resurrection of the soul is just as real as the resurrection of the body. And the resurrection of the soul and spirit 
must take place before the resurrection of the body. If that first resurrection has not taken place, there will be no part in the second. He goes on to say, it is by that resurrection of our souls that they become a fitting unity with our resurrection bodies. It is the soul that glorifies the body, and thus soul and body both pass through each its literal resurrection to the final glorious unification. That is just a picture-perfect, well-said description of what we're talking about. When we die, they'll put our old bodies in the grave. But our resurrection soul, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. And when we die, our soul and spirit go to be with the Lord, and it awaits this reunification. But if we have not had the first resurrection, we will not partake in the second. Mm. This is so clear. The hour is coming, and now is, right now. When you're going to pass from death to life, if you believe I am who I am and uh, believe what I say, that's all you got to do. Just believe what I'm saying. Believe the Father sent me. You got it. But if you don't, there's there was no other way around this. So that is just so beautifully expressed. It is so plain. It's so simple. This is one of the foundational Puritan truths that has just fallen the way of the modern Googly Glock. I mean, it's just so, and, and the reason why we have to contend for the faith, um, Jude said that we must earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It was delivered by Christ, and we have to fight for it, because everything almost to a T that's being put out is coming against the doctrine of Christ. We are in the apostasy, and we have to fight for it, and fight for it we will. It's just like David and Goliath. He said, uh, you know, <laughs> all of his brothers, but uh, man, this guy, is, he's a runt. He can't go out and fight the giant. David said, is there not a cause? They have defied the words of the Most High God. Is there not a cause? And there's a cause. We are to earnestly contend and fight for the faith that's once delivered unto the saints, because people's lives and souls, not only their physical life, but their eternal life depends on it. There is only life in Christ and nowhere else. So we will fight, we will gladly fight, and do anything that we can to bring people unto the to true source of life through the gospel. Jude was saying that, and he had written that, like, it looks like maybe just 30 or 40 years after the the ascension of Christ, and it was, and he was saying, "Then we've got to fight for this." I mean, how much more now, two thousand years later? Yeah, yeah. And it was his half brother. Yeah, he grew up in the Jesus house, and, and he probably that? he was probably one of the brothers that didn't believe him while he was growing up. Did it? Yeah, Remember that'd be that? kind of that'd be kind of a hard one, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you know. But and you know what I ask people when this scripture comes up to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, I ask them, who delivered it? Who delivered that faith to the saints? You know, was it Moses? Was it Isaiah? No, it was Christ. He delivered the faith unto the saints. He sealed it in his blood, and he raised from the dead to ratify the covenant. And we fight for it. We fight for it every week, gladly so, uh, because there is a cause, because the souls of people, you know, the Bible is real. People that are not born again will, will spend an eternity in a devil's hell. That's why we preach the gospel. We tell them that good news, life and immortality is brought to life through the gospel. To be immortal, better than a Marvel movie, immortality, everlasting life with Christ, through faith in Christ. And uh, that glorious new covenant. Now, all you got to do, if you want to say so long farewell to the millennial reign teaching, all you have to know is two verses of what Jesus said, John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good 
unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, after talking about the first resurrection, Jesus talks about the second resurrection of the body, and he says there's an hour, very specifically, there's a day and an hour when everybody's going to be resurrected, good and bad. The millennial reign teachers say, oh, oh, no, no, no. There's going to be a thousand years between the resurrection of the good and the evil. Now, you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to either believe Jesus, but there's a price for believing Jesus here. You're going to have to say so long farewell to that old millennial reign teaching, and uh, that ain't going to make you real popular down at the glory barn. But it's, you see, life is in Christ. Life is transmitted from believing what Jesus said. These are his very words. Verily, verily. And when Jesus says verily, verily, he's really emphasizing a point. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's the only place it comes from. There's no other way. And when we meditate upon this attribute of God, this is uh, something, I mean, we need. We don't need to be even a little bit fuzzy here. I mean, we need to have this right, clear in our minds. We need to understand it. We need to not have any confusion or doubts about it. Our eternal life is is the most important thing, and it comes through the most important thing in our life, the doctrine of Christ. And in, uh, this is emphasized. Jesus doubles down here. In John 6, 39, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day, not seven years before the last day. And the resurrection of the body will take place on the last day of this age of the good and the bad. So, you know, Jesus said what he said, and uh, he doubles down on, he says the same thing again in John 640 and John 654. He repeats, he repeats this truth, one for the Father, once for the Son, and once for the Holy Ghost. It's right there. So we really do have a choice before us. We either, uh, you can argue with me or, and I won't argue this because you can't, it's a sin to argue the truth. It's very clear forth didactic statements by Christ. We either choose to believe what it obviously says, or we'll have to believe something else. Joel Osteen will get in Yankee Stadium and says, I don't want anyone to think God's mad at anybody here. The Bible says, John three thirty six. He that believeth not on the Son, the wrath of God abideth on him. That's why we warn people with all of the unction that the Spirit will give us, that now's the time to turn. You were born spiritually dead, but you can have the life of God through faith in Christ. And that is our message. That'll be our message this week, next week, a year from now, because of life and immortality comes forth through the gospel, and it, it, it doesn't come any other way. Nope, it sure doesn't. Um, I want to read another statement from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. had a great article on life on page 852, and it says this, the divine gift of life, which has here primarily a natural sense, is understood as the saving gift of eternal life in terms of an eschatological religion of redemption. Thus, and and this, as the other lexicon will, it will tell you how this word is used, not only in Scripture, but in non-canonical references. We're going to look at one of these because it's very important. It says, thus, 4th Maccabees, 818 is adduced with Ezekiel 37 and Proverbs 318 as proof of the resurrection and eternal life. In other words, the author is saying that in the Old Testament and in the non-canonical writings, 4th Maccabees, 4th Maccabees did not make King James Apocrypha. 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees did. Third and fourth did not, but it's an excellent historical book. We're going to read a little bit from it. But this is what he's saying, that the idea all through beginning to end 
is that when people believed that they had the life of God in them, they knew that that meant that they would be resurrected physically after they die. They understood. You see, we need to get back to that. We need to understand that our resurrection of our body one day will depend upon whether we had the life of God in us when we stopped sucking air. And this is so important. And that's what this author is saying about 4th Maccabees. And we're going to go over there and read it because this, this is a concept that's hugely important for us to have crystal clear. Now, let's go to this text in uh, 4th Maccabees. And this is in uh, chapter 18. And let's read the text the author was referring to. And let's read verses 16 through 18. He recounted to you Solomon's proverb, there is a tree of life for those who do his will. And there again, right here in this text, if you do his will, there's, there's life for you. He confirmed the saying of Ezekiel, shall these dry bones live? Ezekiel 37, the dry bones coming together. For he did not forget to teach you the song that Moses taught, which says, I kill and I make alive. This is your life and the length of your days. It's right there. And as the author rightly said, this text, Old Testament text, New Testament text, they make this connection that eternal life and relationship now will determine whether your body will be resurrected. It's the same life. It's a continuity. That life is in Christ and in our relationship with him. Well, Let's read, and this is such a powerful concept that if it would come down, and it's already come down to that for many believers, that you would have to die for Christ rather than deny him. The element that enabled the martyrs to die for Christ is this very belief. They believed that because they had the life of God in them right now, that even if they died and had their physical life taken from them, that their body would be resurrected. And this is so strong here in the book of 4th Maccabees. In the book of 4th Maccabees, it was written about 167 B.C. Now, let's look at another text here. And this just shows us the strong continuity um, of this idea, and this is the faith of the Israel of God. This is the faith of the martyrs. And in 4th Maccabees chapter 15, and I want to read verses 2 and 3, and there's a story here about a mother, and this mother had seven of her sons killed before her eyes. And it says here in 4th Maccabees 15, two and three, two courses were open to this mother, that of religion and that of preserving her seven sons for a time, as the tyrant has promised. She loved religion more, religion that preserves them for eternal life, according to God's promise. This woman, 167 years before Christ, allowed her seven sons to be slain in front of her rather than deny deny the, the, the father and disobey him because she believed that the eternal life she had and the eternal life that was in her children would one day raise them from the dead even if their life was taken. Hmm. Now, what you know what I want to know, Jimmy? What do you want to know? I want to know why they were so mad at this woman. I mean, why were they so mad? What's all about? Why were they so mad at this woman that they killed her seven sons in front of her? I mean, we really need to know this, don't we? Yeah. Um, well, let's find out. Fourth Maccabees chapter five. It says the tyrant Antosius sitting in state with his counselors on a certain high place and with his armed soldiers standing above him 
ordered the guards to seize each and every Hebrew and to compel them to eat pork and food sacrifice to idols if any were not willing to eat defiling food they were to be broken on the wheel and killed this woman had her seven sons slain before her because she refused to disobey god and eat pork and in in chapter 8 and in verse 2 it tells you all should have had to do for when the tyrant was conspicuously defeated in his first attempt, being unable to compel an aged man to eat defiling foods. Then in a violent rage, he commanded that others of the Hebrew captives be brought and that any who ate defiling food should be freed after eating. But if any were to refuse, these should be tortured even more cruelly. And old Antosius, he could cook him up some pork chops and he had a big old mound of mashed potatoes and gravy and all you had to do just sit down and have your big old feast or you could be tortured till you die slow and painful what on earth and and you know what did these people have they had a faith that wasn't just some little passing idea they knew what the life of God was. Even before the cross, these people were so convinced of the life of God. Like Job said, though he slay me, I will not deny him. That he knew that he would in his flesh see God. And this is just so, it just emphasizes to us this tremendous importance of understanding the life of God and really knowing the life of God in you to feel that. Um, life, because if you don't really believe, I mean, if all you believe is that when your physical body dies, that's it. You're not going to die for Christ. You have to firmly believe that what you have now is going to resurrect your body later. That's the faith of the martyrs. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, these these people in Maccabees were still doing the right thing because Jesus hadn't yet come and declared all foods clean, right? (laughs) Yeah. Now, let, 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 let's think about this just a minute. Jesus hadn't changed Leviticus 11 yet. so Right. right. Now, let, let's think about this. Now, this happened about 167 B.C., but let's just think about one day before Christ rose from the dead. Now, then, according to their theology, and rightly so according to the Word of God, that it would have been right and proper to refuse to disobey God to eat unclean food, even to the point of death. But then, 24 hours later, we could have another woman, and it would be right and proper for her to save her family by eating unclean food. Now, that's just asinine and ridiculous. Just asinine and ridiculous. And this is another one of these issues. Well, this is controversial. My goodness, are you going to make a big deal out of this? I absolutely am, because the Father makes a big deal out of it. And you know, when everyone talks about, well, who do you want to say when you get to heaven? Well, I want to see this little woman and her seven sons, because you better believe they're going to be there. I I mean, and I think they're going to be right up close to the throne, because my goodness, this is the this is the faith of the martyrs. I'm sure she got killed right after that, too, right? Yeah. Um, it's just amazing. And we'll just, just read a little more here. Cause it's just, it's just a tremendous, this whole book is just a tremendous testimony to her in, uh, fourth Maccabees 15 and six. It says the mother of the seven boys more than any mother loved her children in seven pregnancies. She had implanted in herself tender love toward them. And it wasn't because she did not love her children. She did but she loved the Lord more. Down in verse 14, it says, this mother who saw them tortured and burned one by one because of religion did not change her attitude. She watched the flesh of her children consumed by fire, their toes and fingers scattered on the ground and the flesh of the head to the chin exposed like mask. Oh, mother, 
tried now more than bitter pains than even the birth pangs who you suffered for them. O woman who alone gave birth to such complete devotion, when the firstborn breathed his last, it did not turn you aside, nor when the second in torments looked at you piteously, nor when the third expired, nor did you weep when you looked at the eyes of each one in their tortures, gazing boldly at the same agonies and saw in their nostrils the signs of the approach of death. When you saw the flesh of children burned upon the flesh of other children, severed hands upon hands, scalped heads upon heads, and corpses fallen on other corpses. And when you saw the place filled with many spectators of the torturings, you shed not tears. How great and many torments the mother then suffered as her sons were tortured on the wheel with hot irons, but devout reason giving her heart Man's courage in the very midst of her emotions strengthened her to disregard her temporal love for her children, although she witnessed the destruction of seven children and the ingenious and various rackings, this noble mother disregarded all these because of faith in God. And it's just so touching to me, and it's so encouraging, too, that there have been saints of God that have stood without compromise, and this is truly what the life of God will enable us to do. And this is what in, enabled Abraham. Let's think about Abraham for a minute. And I, I certainly hope that none of us, our listeners, are ever in a situation like this, but there are horrific situations already taking place now. And um, I think we're all intelligent enough to know what's coming. We, we, we know and we understand that we have to have our faith prepared with the, the very faith that is based upon the life of God. Faith in God transmits the life of God to us, and understanding the life of God will even enable us, if we have to, to lay down our life in a certain hope of the resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 17, the scripture says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac thy seed shall be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham knew that if he would be obedient, that that life of God would raise his son from the dead. And of course, the Lord came in and he stopped that. I want to look at a couple more examples. And you know, a lot of people, uh, they get very angry when you try to add. And I, I tell you what, the issue of eating unclean foods is import, more important now than ever. It's not only disobedience against God and defilement, but the things that they're putting into food, the genetic manipulation, the contamination. Um, I heard a figure the other day, and I pray it's not right, but I fear it is, that 83% of our meat is coming from China. And as you know, the the price of it's it's going to be uh, a hamburger is going to cost 10 bucks, but you'll be able to buy one of Billy Goat's bio burgers and a big sack of fries for about 59 cents, you know, and I, I'm to the point, you know, you you, you quit uh, the, the list of things that we scratch off that we're not going to buy and eat. And I have scratched out buying beef from stores now because I don't trust it. Um, if I if I get beef, I'm going to get it where I know it comes from, because it, these things are spiritually and physically devastating. And people think, well, boy, you're just harping on something. Well, I am, but it's very important. And I would just like to read a couple of scriptures here and just have some people pray about them of the, the deep ramifications of this. Let's, let's look at Isaiah 65. And now we're looking things that are prophetic. And let's look at Isaiah chapter 65, beginning in verse 2. 
He said, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, you know? And like we said, the carnal mind, uh, it will gratify the flesh. And they were walking after their own thoughts, and it wasn't good for them. You know, the Father is trying to tell you some stuff that's good for you. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels. Now, this is one of many places where the eating of pork is tied with demonic rituals. The Bible says to learn not the way of the heathen. Um, this is Edward Young's commentary on this text, and it, it's very stunning. It really is. And it says here, uh, it refers to the practice of incubation or consulting the dead, a practice forbidden in Scripture, and eating flying swish, flesh, another practice forbidden in Leviticus 11.7. And there was a connection between the eating of the pork and the satanic ritual. This was important to them. And of course, they knew that by eating that, they were defying God. You know, it's just like a Satanist saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. It's defying God, and it's deeply tied to the realm of Satan and disobedience to God. Now, let's consider one more scripture here, and just read this scripture and pray about it. And, I mean, gee, but let's read Isaiah 66, and let's read verses 16 and 17. And the scripture says here, for by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now, we're prophesying here a little bit. We're talking about the return of the Lord when he is going to come with fire and sword and plead with all flesh. Isaiah 65 and 66, they are chapters that tell us about the new heavens and the new earth. Look at verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Now, this is a prophetic scripture that talks about people that are eating abominable things of uh, defiling the Lord, and they're going to they're gonna get fried. Now, here again, we see these people, and I'll read Joseph Benson's comment on this. I'll bring out my old book on us again here. And uh, Joseph Benson, he had this to say about it. He said, there were several sorts of lustrations or pur purifications used among the heathens from whence the Jews learned their idolatrous custom, some of which were performed by washings, for which purpose they had fountains in their sacred groves and gardens. And the, these things are intricately tied to the demonic. So this is something that, think about that little woman. Think about that little woman that would rather give her life or her life for her of her children because she knew what the life of God was. And this is how important the life of God is to us. And when we study this attribute, the things we've said here are so clear. They're so simple that it's hard to even begin to make more than out of them than what they say. People will do it to their own destruction. But we have to be clearly fixed, and we have to know that we have the life of God in us and understand that that life is going to hold good even under the resurrection of our bodies after we die. And this was summed up very good by Christ. We'll close here with what Jesus said in John chapter 11. And in John 11, verse 25 and 26, he said, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, 
Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, and of course that that tells us that even if you die, you're going to live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If we live and we believe in Christ, we'll never die. And then he asked the big question, believest thou this? If we really believe that Jesus is the resurrection of our life, the resurrection and the life, it will truly enable us to be faithful unto death. With all of my heart.